whenever you are. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to see you all on this beautiful day. And I just have a few announcements for those of you who haven't been paying any attention. We have some primary forums coming up at the end of the month, starting on Tuesday, April 19th, followed on Thursday, the 21st, and the 20, next Tuesday, and the next Thursday, and the next Tuesday, ending on May 3rd. So the first one is going to be uh, US Rep CD5, the Democratic candidates. And the second one will be the Republican candidates. And the third one will be the Deschutes County commissioners. The fourth one will be CD2, although that has not been, we have not received confirmation from Congressman Benz yet whether or not he's participating. And uh, then the last one will be CD2 uh, for the Democratic candidates. And this year we're doing something a little different. We're having different moderators. Um, and we think that this is going to work out really well as far as publicity and stuff. So we have Aaron Switzer from The Source will be one of the first moderator. Then we have Mike Fisher, who's a local um, journalist. He actually works for KPOV 88.9 Community Radio. And then for the Deschutes County Commissioner, we have Jerry O'Brien from The Bulletin. And Matt McDonald will be doing CD2. He's on COTV. And Emily Curriton who was one of our speakers with uh, Jerry O'Brien a few weeks ago is, is going to do CD2, the last one for the Democrats. So it should be a, a nice mix of uh, different people. And I'm sure that the forums are all going to be very interesting if any of you have had a chance to look at some of the recordings that other people have done recently. Also, uh, you got a notice a couple of weeks ago from me about contributions. And one of the reasons I had Mimi send this out was because the US League has been constantly sending us emails asking for money. And we need the money here. We have a lot of forums coming up this year and we have lots of things that we wanna do. And I just think that, you know, kind of like shopping, you need to do it local. They get more than enough of our money through our dues. And so if you're generous enough to think about making a contribution, make it to us and we'd be very grateful. Uh, also, if you paid, if you've read your echoes, we have an upcoming event, a special musical performance. We were contacted by um, Maureen Popovich, and she is going to do a presentation based on music from for the Equal Rights Amendment. So that is on Saturday, May twenty first at six thirty, and so I look forward to maybe uh, having some of you come out for the evening. And it will be only an hour, and it'll probably be a nice way to spend a spring night. Um, also, Annie wrote a great letter in the bulletin and referenced our affordable housing study. So um, we've just had wonderful recognition from all kinds of people. And as I see, Annie is in the background waving. So, <laughs> all right. So that is all that I have. Uh, anybody else have any a quick announcement before Karen starts her portion of it? All right, Karen, turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Today, I'm happy to welcome our two speakers from Climate Solutions. As a Northwest-based clean energy economy nonprofit, Climate Solutions works to champion transformational policies and market-based innovations, catalyze powerful partnerships and a diverse movement for action and accountability, and communicate a bold vision for solutions at the scale required by climate science. Dr. Jackie Dingfelder, the president of the Board of Climate Solutions, brings more than three decades of environmental planning and policy experience in the private, nonprofit, and public sectors. Her professional career includes executive director for River Restoration Northwest, watershed program manager at For the Sake of the Salmon, consulting in environmental planning in the private sector, Environmental and Planning Policy Director for Portland Mayor Charlie Hales, and over a decade in the Oregon House and Senate, where she chaired the House Energy and Environment Committee and the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee. Jackie has a PhD in Public Policy and Affairs from Portland State University in the Hatfield School of Government, where in her spare time, she serves as an adjunct professor. Jackie is also a part-time resident of Central Oregon. Meredith Collinley, the Director of Climate Solutions, bring, the Oregon Director of Climate Solutions, brings over a decade of climate policy experience to her work accelerating Oregon's transition to a clean energy economy. 
She advocates for innovative and equitable policy solutions to reduce pollution and create clean energy jobs across the state. Currently, Meredith leads a team diligently working to electrify everything from cars, trucks, and buses to homes and buildings and power it at all with 100% clean electricity. Prior to joining Climate Solutions, Meredith was a private sector attorney and then became a climate and energy attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council. At NRDC, she advanced renewable energy policies in the US and internationally. She also implemented programs to protect public health and improve climate resilience to heat waves and air pollution in India's growing cities. In her free time, Meredith enjoys exploring her incredible home state of Oregon with her family and rooting too loudly for the Portland Timbers and Thorns. Please welcome Jackie Dingfelder and Meredith Conley. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Well, it's wonderful to see you and uh, be with you. Of course, it would be better if we were in person, but both Meredith and I were in Portland today. So we appreciate this being virtual. Uh, so Meredith is going to need to share her screen yeah, to show the slideshow. Great. So I will go, that. yeah, so she will put that on and then we'll get started because I know uh, we, we don't want to talk too long. We just want to provide an overview of the work that we're doing at Climate Solutions and then leave time for questions and answers. And uh, I just want to say that we're very fortunate that Meredith had the time because she's incredibly busy, uh, especially after you're going to hear about all the work that the Oregon uh, staff has been working on over the past uh, few months. Uh, so, as you know, as you see, I'm the board chair. Meredith Connolly is the Oregon director. We have both an Oregon and Washington office, which I'll explain here in just a minute. And this is one of our staff people. What was that two days after her first day at work in Salem uh, for climate action? All right, next slide. So Climate Solutions is a regional nonprofit whose mission is to accelerate clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. We are in our 24th year with teams in both Washington and Oregon. And I should say that our board member, I think we're up to 20 board members now, are uh, both from Oregon and, and Washington. So next slide. A little bit about what we do. As a Northwest-based clean energy economy nonprofit, Climate Solutions works to champion transformational policies and market-based innovations, to catalyze powerful partnerships and a diverse movement for action and accountability. And we also communicate a bold vision for solutions at the scale required by climate science. I'm just going to talk a little bit about how we work. I'm not going to read all these slides. You can read those on your own. But first, uh, we know from the science and the most recent IPCC report that was released by the UN on Monday reiterated this, that to address the global climate crisis, we need action and investments at every level of government throughout the private sector and in our communities. The broader West Coast region, spanning from California to British Columbia, stands as the world's fifth largest economy, and innovations here can make a significant difference. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. But when I was a legislator, I unfortunately used to hear from some of my colleagues, well, what difference does it make if Oregon passes these laws? We're 1% of the national economy. And as you can see from this map, it does make a difference because this shows you uh, just with the West Coast states and actually the, the Southwest states, the momentum that's going on and the progress nationwide. Unfortunately, as you can see, there's a big gap in the central part of the US and the Southern part, not a big surprise, but certainly the West is uh, leading in the energy revolution. Next slide. Now, here in Oregon, there's been some real momentum, well, 
in, in recent years, both in Oregon and Washington. And as this slide, you see some of the bills that have passed in the most recent sessions. Meredith will be uh, drilling down a little bit more uh, on, it's a terrible pun to use for talking about renewables, but she'll be drilling down a little bit more on the specifics for uh, what was passed this last session in Oregon. So we've been making quite a bit of progress over the years. I will say uh, 2007 uh, is when I was able to work on the uh, passing the renewable portfolio standard. And so over the past decade, I think we've really uh, sort of upped our game and made some uh, huge progress. Next slide. Uh, so with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Meredith to set the background and then talk more specifically about what's happening here in Oregon, both at the state and the local level. So with that, I will hand it off to you, Meredith. Thanks, Jackie. And thanks everyone for tuning in and hearing a little bit about um, what we do as an organization, which is also just very grounded in what Oregon needs to do um, to make climate progress and uh, a clean energy transition uh, over these next few decades. Um, first, uh, this is not a depressing um, presentation, I promise, um, especially with the IPCC uh, report coming out of the UN earlier this week and just the topic of the climate crisis. It can be, um, I recognize, quite negative, but there's is a lot of room for hope. I get hope from action and there's a lot of action and forward momentum happening and a lot more to do that um, I think we can um, do together. But the uh, just a little grounding um, it, that I, I feel like I don't really need to uh, paint a picture for anyone living in Central Oregon between the droughts and the wildfires and the extreme heat and extreme storms and flooding we've had along the coast. Um, this past two years has been just uh, horrible from a climate impact standpoint and um there's there's more ahead so when we think about where we need to go as a state integrating more resilience to the climate impacts that are here as we address and transition to the clean energy sources we need there's a lot of uh mutually beneficial solutions that we need to start weaving together um, in a bigger way a little grounding of how we focus our work this is from the Oregon Global Warming Commission. That is a commission set up uh, ja Jackie was in the legislature. Um, and they advise and give updates to the legislature and the state on how far we are on making progress toward meeting our greenhouse gas goals. Um, this chart is a li little um, interesting to look at for a few reasons. You can see, first of all, where we're going on our greenhouse gas emissions. Unfortunately, they have been climbing over the past few years. If you look at that top black line and where the orange line um, shows where some of our policies make a dent, but um, don't get us where we need to go, which is toward that uh, green line um, and even beyond it, uh, which sets the greenhouse gas goals of the state based on the most recent climate executive order by Governor Brown. This orange line, the good news is there are updates coming now because this is from 2020 and we have made a lot of progress in the last two years uh, and really started to change that trajectory. Um, the where we focus our work is on those biggest sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation being the largest, uh, our buildings being the second largest because that is where you see the electricity use and the rest of the residential and commercial emissions come in from direct fossil fuel use and then some policies on, on industry um, and natural and working lands. So I will um, go from here uh, to really drill down just a little again. When we're talking about um, where our climate pollution comes from, it's primarily our transportation and buildings. And that's why what we do at this city level matters as much as it does at the state level um, because we're, we need system changes, but a lot of those are also handled um, at the local level. So first, some positive news as we talk about electricity, I, I won't talk about it long because we we really moved needle in a huge way in the 2021 legislative session by passing among the most ambitious 100% clean laws in the country. 
Uh, we were not the first to pass this law. We had passed coal to clean in 2016, and that uh, put us on a timeline to phase out our coal emissions from the state uh, and required 50% renewables to be built um, to power our grid. However, what we saw was as coal was retiring, uh, the electric utilities were primarily starting to lean more on gas instead, build new gas plants, buy more gas, um, instead of leapfrogging to solar, wind, storage, other clean energy solutions. Now we have a law that um, squeezes out the fossil gas power plants as well in our mix. And um, we will get to 100% clean electricity for our biggest utilities by 2040. And the law also really looked at how are we, um, and this is what we're really minding when we implement this law, is really how are we looking across the whole state and making sure this clean energy transition benefits everyone? Uh, where are the investments in rural communities to increase resilience? Uh, there's a $50 million fund for microgrids and other resilience measures, uh, solar and storage programs across the state. Um, and that is something that we will continue to be working on along with hardening the grid and other things we need to do as we make this transition to replacing those power plants with renewable sources. But it's quite exciting to see Oregon go from laggard to leader in this, in this area in the last year. Now that we have this 100% clean grid, it's big part of replacing all those fossil fuel sources you saw in that greenhouse gas emission chart. We need to replace those as much as possible with electricity and cleaner fuels for what we can electrify. Uh, that is how we replace uh, the diesel and gasoline on our road as well at, with, with clean power while we clean up the grid as well so that it is 100% clean power. Um, this is our biggest source. There's a lot of solutions we need to clean up our transportation. We also need to dramatically reimagine how we have communities that are uh, connected with biking and walking and transit options as well and fewer single car trips, that's more possible in some communities than others and is a lot about land use and how we plan our cities and investing in safer walking and biking and more robust public transit. Uh, we need to electrify, as I said, everything we can. And then also use cleaner fuels that are available now that don't use fossil fuels for the uh, remaining fleets on the road. And I'll get into some details because we've actually, I'll go a little deeper on transportation because it's a little bit of a case study of the strides we've really made over these past few years. The way we think about approaching, so I just said all the things we need to do, which can be quite daunting to think about how they all fit together. You could distill a lot of where we need to go into um, policies and regulations. We need to create that market certainty. Uh, we need, frankly, just waiting for the market to do it won't be enough. Um, I think we have 2% of cars on the road right now in Oregon are electric. Um, we have to speed things up and there's been a lot of subsidies and uh, status quo bias toward the fossil fuel alternatives. So we need these stronger policies and regulations coming from the state to encourage it. But we also know it's a chicken or the egg uh, dynamic with going electric is having charging stations. Um, and that's true for individual cars, but that's also true for the big bus depots. This is one of the innovative um, charging stations for TriMet with some of their newer electric buses that can charge an entire bus's battery um, in less than an hour. And then there's also, and it's overhead. So they just pull right up and it drops down and charges it. I've seen it in action, it's quite cool. Um, and then besides the infrastructure, we also need incentives. It is still more expensive to um, upfront to get an electric vehicle or electric truck uh, electric bus. So we need those rebates for to make sure that everyone can afford to reap the benefits. The nice thing is once you own an electric alternative, it is much less expensive. It is, we've all been watching the roller coaster at the gas pump lately, and it is a dollar, um, an e-gallon, the electricity equivalent of fueling your car up with electricity in Oregon. We are actually, it is the least expensive in Oregon than any other state to fuel up with electricity. So once you get past that upfront cost and the charging needs, it's quite beneficial to your pocketbook too. 
Uh, so here's a little bit about um, some of the progress we've, we've made recently and hopefully starts to show up uh, in Central Oregon and everywhere else. Uh, one at the agency level, um, DEQ, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality, uh, passed a advanced clean truck rule last year. We, it now mandates that we sell electric bus uh, trucks and other medium-sized delivery trucks, all kinds of uh, vehicles into Oregon by an increasing amount over time. California had this law and the dynamic that was happening was Daimler um, was making electric buses here in Oregon and shipping all of them down to California uh, because they were required to sell them into that state. Now they will also have to sell them into Oregon and we can start replacing the diesel trucks on our road with electric ones, which has huge public health benefits. It, those are what are responsible for much of the, the NOx and other pollutants um, in our communities. That was adopted last year. We were the second state to adopt this rule and then four other states passed it uh, right on our heels, Washington, New York, and others. Now, uh, DEQ, this, later this year, um, we hope we'll uh, pass a, a similar, rule, similar rule for passenger vehicles. And they'll require 100% of, of passenger vehicles after 2035 will be zero emission vehicles and not internal combustion engines. California is hopefully passing that rule um, this summer and we can, we can follow. That'll give us really clear guidance and gives the car manufacturers and the whole market um, clear timelines that um, after a certain point, it will be all electric and we need to be building out the infrastructure now and planning for that and hopefully get there even sooner. Uh, we're also, uh, we worked on some legislation, um, th these both passed in the 2021 legislative session to help with the accessibility and affordability of going electric. So EV incentives uh, for folks um, to expand some programs that the state had so that it is less expensive up front when you buy an electric car. Um, one neat part of it um, that is really important from an equity, equity standpoint is that for those who are lower moderate income, you actually get double the amount of state rebate and it can be applied toward a new or used EV. Um, so please tell your friends and family. Uh, the utilities also have a role to play in, in installing EV charging and this really enshrined that. Um, and then as we, as we construct new buildings, um, it's much more expensive if you don't have the plumbing for charging and uh, all of those those pieces up built into new construction, which I know is near and dear to everyone's heart in Bend and elsewhere where it's just booming and there's so much construction happening. Now all new residential, commercial and multifamily homes will be EV ready. So all you have to do is add that charger. Um, really quickly, two other big banner policies. Um, Clean Fuels Program has really been the workhorse of uh, decarbonizing our transportation fuels uh, in Oregon since 2015. This program has achieved a temp, uh, by 2025, we'll have reduced 10% of the carbon intensity of our fuels. That means everything from blending uh, ethanol into gasoline to reduce how much carbon emissions it has. So everyone fueling up um, has lower carbon intensity. It means there's biodiesel and renewable diesel and these alternatives that are made with waste grease and fats from restaurants and otherwise uh, being turned into fuels. And we've seen whole businesses start uh, sequential uh, fuel biofuels, for example, to build this out. Renewable diesel is now what powers the entire TriMet bus fleet, Port of Portland and others. Um, and now, and it also um, funds much of the electric investments we need. All the electric school buses on the road in Oregon right now, um, I believe this photo is out of the Beaverton School District, uh, but there are school districts across the state who now have electric school buses uh, thanks to the Clean Fuels Program. And uh, as well as charging, um, this is the ribbon cutting I think from Ashland, there's public charging stations in Baker City and elsewhere. This year, because of the governor's climate executive order um, that she signed in 2020 after those climate walkouts, it, it set a course to more than double the clean fuels program over the next decade. Um, we are hearing DQ just announced uh, last week, they are actually thinking of tripling it um, or more, um, maybe up to 37% by 2035. 
that would make or reassert Oregon as a leader um, among the West Coast states who all have this program and really um, continue to reap those benefits over the next decade and, and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions enormously. Finally, in the transportation sector, um, we have a climate protection program that was also kicked off by Governor Brown's climate executive order. That has the first mandatory limits on our greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector, as well as over our gas utilities and other fossil fuel emissions like propane. Uh, it, uh, it is, has quite ambitious targets uh, that are really necessary uh, to get us back on closer to on track to our climate goals as a state. So 50% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2035, 90% by 2050 for those who are in the program. Unless you think our work is done, um, ODOT, the Department of Transportation put out this um, uh, study last year about what our transportation infrastructure needs are, what kind of EV charging we need, where we need it, all of that. And they found we need to uh, increase by a five-fold how many EV chargers we're installing per year by between now and 2025. So that's really the work, a lot of the work ahead um, in this sector. Um, we are getting 52 million from the federal government in the Infrastructure Act that passed last year. And that will, will start to fill this hole, but much more is also needed. And my last topic is, is uh, where really a growing focus of our work as well as um, the broader climate community. I think we in Oregon have not paid as much attention as we should to this topic and are, are now having to really catch up to where other states are on, on cleaning up our buildings and imagining how we can um, think about our, our homes and buildings that are our first line of defense from uh, climate impacts like wildfire and extreme temperatures to also be fossil free and um, and not fueling the climate uh, crisis as well. Uh, so a little bit of information here. Um, natural gas, um, which is used for, uh, as you can see, almost 40% of the home heating in Oregon right now is primarily made up of methane. Methane is an incredibly potent uh, greenhouse gas. It warms, uh, it, it, when it goes up into the atmosphere, it is over 80% more warming than uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, so cutting methane has a huge impact on reducing our, um, the impacts of climate change. And it's growing really rapidly, as you can see by these numbers on this chart here in Oregon. Um, there's also a lot coming out from uh, scientific studies about the potent health impacts. These, I'm a mom of young children. This one was particularly uh, scary to me. Um, children who grow up in homes with gas stoves are 42% more likely to develop asthma symptoms. There have been other information coming out about how much they leak even when they're off. I experienced that myself. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to start to think about transitioning off of gas um, as a fuel in our homes, uh, which is expanding in many areas, including um, Bend and elsewhere. Uh, before, I think a lot of us built all electric. I grew up in a more rural area outside of Salem. There was no gas, but now the newer developments and homes near my, my folks who still live there are, are now all gas because um, the system has expanded to reach there. There are a lot of clean energy solutions that um, can replace that. Um, an electric heat pump is a pretty amazing technology. Uh, it provides both heating and cooling. Uh, this is becoming increasingly valuable as many folks are needing air conditioning or cooling devices in their homes now. Um, we saw a real run on installing air conditioning after the 116 degree days last year. Um, and uh, this slide's from Electrify Now, um, a great group in Oregon, but it shows that um, how much the um, electric heat pumps perform better from a greenhouse gas standpoint. They also save folks a lot of money um, because they are so much more energy efficient than gas furnaces. Uh, the average Oregonian could save $2,000 to $3,000 on their heating bills over the life of a heat pump. 
the Oregon legislature this last session just that just ended um, passed uh, a new bill creating a fund for electric heat pumps for low income Oregonians and also one for uh, landlords to use so that uh, tenants and renters uh, can can start to have these devices and save money on their energy bills. Uh, so just to wrap up um, this, so we can just turn to the more fun part, the dialogue and conversation. Uh, you know, we, uh, we do have clean energy solutions to the crises we're facing and they frankly make life better too. <laughs> um, they're affordable, they're scalable, they're available now. Um, there is a, uh, often a lack of political will, a status quo bias um, toward the fossil fuel um, solutions we have, uh, options we have right now, and uh, we don't have time to delay. So we need to be scaling up these solutions uh, and uh, making for a better Oregon. And I think that's where I really like to focus on what motivates me is just thinking about all the positive outcomes that come from making this transition. Um, you know, we, it will be healthier, it will be more equitable, it will be a more resilient Oregon. Uh, and uh, that really motivates me um, in the face of how daunting it can all feel. So what can you do? Um, please call your legislator. Uh, the, uh, it's really, and, and your other elected officials, your city councilors, your county officials, your congressional delegation, tell them you're a climate voter. Just keep showing up at town halls and contacting them and make them make sure they know that you expect climate progress every year. Um, this isn't a check the box. This is something we will have to keep working at year over year. We can't just hunker down and think we're gonna adapt to it. We have to keep pushing for solutions and making changes. And they have a lot of the responsibility to make those systematic changes and make it affordable for everyone. And then if you'd like to follow our work and what we are doing at the state level and at the agency level, um, you can sign up for our email updates and um, sometimes we send text alerts, but not often. Uh, and there will be ways to take action, updates on what's happening. Climate Cast is a bi-weekly news. Uh, we, we, do, we summarize the, the national and international news on climate as well as local news um, into a digest uh, that we send out every other week. And we also do webinars on specific topics if you're interested. And then uh, if you're on social media, so are we. <laughs> and, um, we do have a great event coming up. It's free. It's an online webinar format. Um, it, it is our annual fundraiser, but it's a, it's a discussion with some really impressive uh, uh, folks about that are working on climate solutions specifically in the building space um, from across the country, um, as well as um, Congresswoman Jaya Paul. Uh, so if you go to our Climate Solutions website, it's right on the main page if you'd like to um, sign up to be able to attend. And I will end there with a funny note that I was just out um, spending spring break with my family in Bend. And uh, when we were driving back, they had just released the horses that or brought them back at Black Butte Ranch and we stopped to I enjoy that. And my, my children were convinced that this white horse was a unicorn. Um, spent a lot of time admiring the unicorn uh, before making her drink me back. And I'll stop sharing. I can figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. And I should just say, uh, Karen, before we hand it back to you for questions, uh, Meredith, did you say how much staff we have in the Oregon office? No, there's, um, there is now five of us total as of a couple months ago before that, um, there's four. About two years ago, there was just two of us. So we've grown a lot over the last couple of years, but we're, we're small and mighty. We have one person who focuses on transportation, one who focuses on buildings, one on electricity. I try to know enough to be dangerous on all of them. And then a communications person. So yeah, we're pretty... Um, but we work with partners a lot. There's a lot of great groups and a lot of folks doing this work. Um, we don't do any of this alone. So yeah. Including with the Environmental uh, Learning Center in Bend, correct? Yeah, the Environmental Center in Bend, um, 
actually, I'm, I'm working with Neil Bonsgaard from that group um, right now on a rebuilding task force the state legislature is grappling with for next year. I should have mentioned, because we were falling behind on what we do in this building space on climate, uh, the legislature's brought a task force together to talk about legislative options for next year. And um, the Environmental Center from Bend is one of the other task force members with me on that um, to bring that perspective from the fastest growing city in our state. Great, thank you. Karen, we'll hand it to you. I don't know how you wanna deal with the Q and A if you wanna moderate that and we're happy to try to answer. That. I would do that, thank you. And also to follow up on Meredith's comment about Neil Bounsgaard, I just was wanting to bring people's attention to the fact that we actually had him as one of our first Thursday speakers it, two years ago or a year ago at the end of 2020. So if you wanna view that talk about electric vehicles that he gave us, you can take a look at that. And that would be on our YouTube channel on our League of Women Voters website. Susan um, Cobb posted a great comment about the cli citizens' climate lobby is focused on passing climate mitigation bills at the federal level. And if people are interested in that, she has posted in chat the link to that to ben.citizensclimate.org. And the next one is um, Carrie Podell has said, um, oh, okay, actually, I'll, excuse I'll me. skip that excuse one. Me. Go ahead, Susan. Excuse me, you might want to um, have me resend that since some people weren't on when I first sent it. Maybe Please some do. people don't see it. Okay, I will. Thank you. That. Thank you. Um, jo Joette has a question. Meredith, how have you engaged with the Oregon DLCD Commission's rulemaking to comply with the governor's order 2020 or 2004 to reduce emissions? Yeah, good question, Joette. I I mostly uh, follow the lead of what Mary Kyle and Thousand Friends of Oregon are doing on that front. They're the real leaders in the DLCD arena. Um, so we, our transportation lead works with Oregon Environmental Council and Thousand Friends of Oregon on supporting the good work they're doing a little more on the land use side. It's a really important piece of it. And there's some big, Decisions coming up, I know, on that front as well. Okay. Annette has a great question about, is progress being made to reduce federal subsidies to fossil fuel companies? Uh, my, that's a good question, and it's a necessary thing we need to do. I don't have a very positive response right now in, in that I, I don't think we're doing anything because um, it requires Joe Manchin to pass anything right now. And he's putting the kibosh is my understanding on all of those um, pieces for how to pay for the, the climate elements of the Build Back Better package. So it, it's, it would be low hanging fruit to shift funding from what we subsidize fossil fuels to um, actually pay for the good stuff and what we need to do, but it's not happening yet. And um, I will put in a plug that actually we even subsidize these things here in Oregon. I was talking about the expansion of gas um, in homes and some of the rest of us. That's actually subsidized right now by um, all the rest of us gas rate payers. Um, they're able to say on new construction, you don't have to pay thousands of dollars on the new gas lines into homes because for them, there's a benefit of getting the new customer. So there's um, our Energy Trust of Oregon doesn't allow you to switch. So if you have a gas heater and you wanna use an Energy Trust of Oregon incentive, um, typically they say you have to stick with the fuel you have and just stick with gas and not use that incentive to go electric. So we have, there's a lot of things that aren't aligned with where we're trying to go out on climate and getting off of fossil fuels right now that we hope again, the legislature can address and start to look at more systematically um, here in Oregon too. So Susan has a great question about where does climate solutions stand on using nuclear reactors during the transition? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> the easy punt I have is that nuclear is not, um, we have a basically an in effect a ban on nuclear in Oregon. 
um, it requires the entire state to approve before you'd ever site nuclear in Oregon. So we don't think that'll ever happen. Um, it is true that there is some nuclear in, in Washington in the BPA mix. So if you're on a consumer owned utility, um, which, you know, the co-ops and some of those other um, utilities, there is a little bit sprinkled into the mix that is primarily carbon free hydropower. Um, but those are all built long ago. Um, I know that Pacificor is considering um, some nuclear reactor in Idaho or Wyoming and kind of starting to put that out there, um, who serves a third of um, Oregon's power. So the topic will come up from a, it's in our mix. Um, CUB, um, who's the terrific Citizens Utility Board of Oregon, they, they represent ratepayer um, in all PUC proceedings and are great. Um, they've, they've taken a pretty strong position saying that nuclear reactors are extremely expensive and risky and not likely to be online for a decade or two more. So it feels like a um, throwing money at that when we have much more affordable solutions right now that are less expensive than fossil fuel, um, I feel like the right choice for Oregon rate pairs to be paying for. So that's, I think, a pretty savvy position. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Meredith. Um, both Susan Cobb and Elizabeth have a great question about EV rebates. They're great and good to give lower income folks a double break, but that assumes low income folks have the upfront funds, which they do not, Better to give a break to them at purchase price break and have the car dealer get the rebate. Can you please comment on this concern? Um, Susan, I'm so glad you raised that because that that is there's a few barriers to how we actually, you know, there's these like great ideas, like let's make it less expensive to buy a car. And then there's the actually in effect how it works. And this is one of those dynamics. They have the DQ has now um, created it shifted it to be a cash on the hood rebate so that it is the the car dealer who then goes back and it and fills out the paperwork and gets the money back from the state so that you don't have to come with those upfront funds so yeah i'm so glad you raised that that was a big change that they made this year that is going to make it a lot more usable um there's still other dynamics with incentivizing you know i, I will say i've had a personal experience just going to look for um, an electric vehicle and having, you know, some car salesmen who don't know much about it. Um, I had to come very, very much knowing all the information about it and answering their questions. Them telling me, well, if you don't want to leave Portland ever, that's fine. But, you know, don't get an electric car if you plan to go anywhere in the state, which, and I answered there, I pointed out the range. And, you know, I just, it was pretty interesting experience. Um, and I know folks get talked out of it a lot. And it's something we have to keep thinking about what are the real barriers on the ground to folks going um, electric. I think the more the car companies are actually making that transition now, um, it's getting better. But that's just a, another dynamic to keep solving for. Yeah. And Karen, I just want to comment on, I think it was Susan um, put in something in the post. We don't advocate for nuclear energy, just so you know. I, we do not. We, we advocate for renewables and it's sort of a non-starter in the Pacific Northwest. So it's not anything that we ever even discuss. I mean, Oregon, obviously I moved here and they were dismantling the only nuclear plant. And as Meredith said, uh, Washington, very small part of the mix. And we only have so much control over what Pacific Core does because they're a five state, five state, Meredith? Six, six state. Six state uh, company, private corporation. I, I think most people get their power from Pacific Core in Central Oregon. I know I do. So uh, yeah, I mean, we can, we can require uh, somewhat as far as what they're citing in Oregon, but we cannot, we don't have jurisdiction over what they cite in other states. More do Oregon ratepayers have to pay for it or be on the hook for this its risks? Yeah, thanks for saying that more explicitly. Sorry, I missed saying that up front. Becky Powell has a question about 
there's a big increase in atmospheric met methane over the last seven years, and she was wanting to know more about why that's happening. That's a really good question. Um, and again, this is where I think why the climate community um, is waking up to this more and more, and you see more and more attention and, and conversation about this and, and focus of advocacy. Um, there's the way it shakes out in Oregon, and I can talk about it at a more federal level. Um, the methane in Oregon is uh, about a third comes from agricultural sources, primarily dairies. Um, a third of it comes from landfills, and uh, a third of it comes from, uh, from gas use um, in homes and industry and, um, and our, our electric grid still. So the uh, when you look at where it's coming from and how we can control for it, there's a lot of oil drilling and, and fracking to produce um, gas that uh, has methane leaks at the source. And then every step of the pipeline to get it where it's going, you know, what, if that's happening in North Dakota and they're piping it into Oregon, um, there's leaks of methane all the way along the pipeline before you even get to using it in a home or in industry. So some of that is an accounting, and then there's also just more of that activity happening. Um, we are, there are more and more um, dairies and agricultural use leading to this. Um, there's some positive progress in general on, in, a, in the Oregon too, we passed um, some methane capture regulations at landfills um, to, to help solve that part of the problem. Um, and, there's just a lot more work to do, but it's also um, uh, been one of those kind of under the radar issues of just the extent of it. So some of it, I think, is just the real numbers starting to come out of how much methane has been leaking from these drilling and fracking sites and along these pipelines. If others want to share more, um, welcome to, to do so, but that's my understanding of where we think it's coming from right now. Linda Bonato has an interesting question about what about a soil division? Soil dirt is one of our best carbon sinks and it wasn't mentioned as a solution, reduction to carbon emissions, lawns, highway buildings, agriculture, um, touring over fields, burning and so forth. And then recently I've been hearing a lot more about the carbon captured in the permafrost and the dangers of the um, thawing of the permafrost, which has nothing to do with Oregon or Washington state. So oh, there is a lot to do on natural climate solutions and increasing sequestration. Um, we are blessed with enormous forests and lots of land and agricultural that can be a much bigger part of the solution than they are right now. Um, we as climate solutions focus on our biggest greenhouse gas sectors, um, primarily on the fossil fuel and energy side of things. So that's why my presentation leaned on that, but that is not to suggest that um, our farms and our forests um, and natural systems are not a huge part of it. Nature Conservancy and Sustainable Northwest, um, among many others, lead on a lot of these solutions. Um, and, and Meredith, do you want to mention about the Global Warming Commission report? And then I can put it in the chat because we were part of the effort to help fund uh, more uh, emphasis on that. And I'll go ahead and I can share that in the chat. Yeah, that was a big, a big um, step forward for Oregon was the Global Warming Commission really started to quantify where, where we're at and where we need to go in, in our forests and um, natural systems and start to create sequestration goals for those systems. Um, the, there was actually a bill that we had supported and hoped would pass this last year um, in the legislature to set enshrine those sequestration targets and start to fund more of those activities um, so that um, farms and all of these other and uh, all of those folks doing this work um, could be incentivized to do it. Um, you run into timber interests and the Oregon Farm Bureau and others who um, were opposed to it and don't want to see um, 
requirements or changes to how they do business in the state. And so there's a, that, I, that will come back next year. I have no doubt we need to be putting, you know, having our natural and working lands sop up more of carbon. And um, it also leads to cleaner waterways and all these other benefits as we, when we do things in this more sustainable way. So stay tuned on that front, but the Global Warming Commission is one place to follow the progress. And there's an Oregon Climate um, Agricultural Network, ORCAN, who is also trying to organize sustainable and like-minded um, farmers and other activities like that, that give me a lot of hope just hearing the innovative ideas on the ground that people are already just practicing because it's the right thing to do and could be scalable across the state. Okay, and then Susan Kahn has a comment here about, and I'm not sure if it's about uh, citizen climate lobby and about their position about nuclear re reactors. Susan can comment about them being expensive, polluting to build, no place for radioactive waste. Susan, did you want to comment on that? Well, I think that was already addressed with okay. uh, Jackie's response to my concern mm -hmm. about nuclear. So um, I, I think she already addressed that. Okay. Great. And um, Karen, I just want to mention, I put the link to, it's in the chat. Okay. Uh, I added the link to that's the Oregon Global Warming Commission's report, and you'll see their report right up there. I think it's the latest one. It's really an excellent report. And as Meredith said, we're, we are part of a coalition uh, sort of advocating for movement on this, but the commission, I think, has done a great job. Uh, as she said, Nature Conservancy, which I actually do consulting for them, and the, uh, there's a whole network of groups working on climate issues. So just so you know, uh, we, you know, groups, basically there's niches. And so our niche happens to be, as Meredith mentioned, on the transportation building and, and electrification side, but there's other groups working on carbon sequestration. There's other groups working on uh, equity issues, which is a huge part of all the work that we do, but we actually have groups that are very focused on for instance, you may know that the, um, uh, the, there was a bill that passed that strengthened uh, environmental justice work in the state. And I co-sponsored the first bill in Oregon to create the uh, environmental, environmental justice, justice commission, commission, but there was more uh, emphasis put on that in this last legislative session. The other is, as Meredith mentioned, um, agricultural, there's a whole a group of organizations that are working on reducing carbon footprint in agriculture. There's a Farmers Conservation Alliance that works on reducing water use. And we haven't even touched upon water, but of course, everybody in Central Oregon thinks about water all the time and fire. But uh, there's many groups working on uh, the intersection of climate and, uh, and water use. And Water Watch is probably one of the premier nonprofits in uh, the state working specifically on, on uh, bird dogging, what's happening with water use. So there's a number, there's a myriad of groups working on climate issues. It's just uh, different intersections there along the way. And I think Meredith is posting some of the other links that people had asked about. So I want to be respectful of the time, Karen, because I know you only have about eight minutes left, see right. if there's any other questions. Yeah, there's a couple of more questions. And I also wanted to let people know that I do save the chat. So any links that are in the chat, I will be sure to post in our monthly newsletter echoes so people have access to that. And also Karen, if you, if you are interested, we're happy to share the PowerPoint presentation. I know this is recorded, but for folks who might wanna just have that PowerPoint presentation with, uh, the notes, we're happy to send them as well. So you could distribute it to folks who might not have been able to attend the presentation. Okay, that, that's fine. Yeah, I would appreciate that. There's a question here again from Linda. What about many of our resources for energy still coming from fossil fuels that uh, fuel our electric vehicles, it looks like? not all is coming from re renewable sources. So we're really doing such a good thing. And I think that you've addressed how you're trying to transition to renewable sources for electri electricity generation, but go ahead and comment on that. Yeah, it's a great question, Linda. I'm 
one that comes up a lot. We already, it is, you reduce your greenhouse gas emissions anywhere you plug into the grid in Oregon, regardless if it's PGE or Pacific Core or any of the um, consumer owned utilities who get their electricity uh, resource from BPA. Um, as a, you know, if you're in a consumer owned utility co-op territory, uh, BPA's mix is over 90% carbon free already because it's primarily hydropower. Uh, so that is a huge greenhouse gas reduction to plug into that grid. Um, it is on average in Oregon with Pacific Core and PGE about 50% with hydro and then a slice of wind um, and solar. The rest is still coal and gas, but we are squeezing that out. And especially over this next couple of years, um, there's obviously a long leg on, lag on how long once you buy an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine or an electric appliance versus a fossil fuel powered one, how long you have it for. And by under the new 100% clean law, it's actually our, our power mix has to be 80% carbon free by 2030. So within eight years, it'll be 80% at least carbon-free everywhere in Oregon, and then 90% by 2035, and then 100% by 2040. So we are rapidly cleaning up um, what goes into that electricity. Um, and I can address as far as, uh, there's a something in the chat about, uh, well, two things. One, um, wind turbines to more bird-friendly, that's not something that we specifically work on, but uh, Audubon has been working on with the wind companies and that's, that's happening at both the national, international level uh, because those companies are not based here in Oregon. They're uh, based primarily in other places, but yeah, there is work done to mitigate uh, impacts on, on um, bird migration. Actually, and, I have a fun yeah. one on that one, Jackie. They've yeah found that if you just paint one turbine black instead of white is that deters. visible huh. for birds and so it's the least expensive thing you can imagine but that is one there's there are many solutions um coming also in other ways to address this issue um and it's been getting better over time because of these partnerships with Audubon and others but I just I love how low tech that is and how effective it appears to be Yes. And then as far as the uh, amount going to landfills, I'm really glad that you raised that because I, you know, one thing we didn't talk about that is really uh, interesting because when I worked at the city of Portland, we found that the biggest part of the carbon footprint for cities is also cons consumption, which we didn't really touch upon because again, this is other organizations are working on this and in the past session, uh, there was an effort to, uh, it's, it's basically trying to reduce packaging. I mean, when you think about consumerism, you think about the, the stuff people buy and the packaging, all the energy that goes into the packaging, that's one of the biggest impacts. So right now, all that stuff goes either, you know, composting or recycling or landfill. But I, I actually had a bill that would have required manufacturers, this was years ago, uh, be responsible for packaging. And then there was also talk about a, a, a packaging surcharge. Of course, none of that passed because industry fought it tooth and nail. But there, there are efforts at the state level to reduce, uh, it's called product stewardship. I'm sure you've heard that term before. And it's really, the main thing is, is reducing the packaging from the start. And you know, I always say, this is me personally, anything you can do to buy in bulk and not buy packaging. I mean, I'll tell you, I love Trader Joe's, but I don't buy a lot of stuff there anymore because everything's packaged. So I shop with my dollars and try to support uh, stores that sell bulk, market of choice, food for less, amazing bulk sections. And so you as a consumer can do a lot to reduce packaging. And that has a huge carbon footprint because if you think about all of the stuff that is now being ordered and sent online, you know, the car, like what we don't have, and I think at some point it'd be really interesting is when you, when you buy something or you order something, there's a carbon 
uh, sort of, uh, you know, number, just like when you look at how many calories are in the food you eat, it would be a carbon footprint number that you can look at to see, you know, if I order this, if I buy this, if I go shop locally, what's the difference for my carbon footprint? But we don't really talk about that because, of course, in the U.S., we want to uh, promote consumerism. But that is a huge part of our carbon footprint. And especially now that we're doing so much ordering online and not as so much buying local. So, you know, Amazon overall, we don't know what their carbon footprint, but, and I do know that the places like Amazon are trying to convert to electric vans, which is a start, but that's something we all as individuals can think about every single day is because it's great to have composting and recycling, but that's at the end of the life of the product, right? So if anything we can do to reduce that packaging up front. So I'll get off my soapbox. I know it's uh, one o'clock, Karen. So I know you want to wrap up. Right. There is one last question, if this can be answered quickly. It was about the Property Assessed Clean Energy Program, uh, CPACE. I know that the Deschutes County Commission has been looking at CPACE within Deschutes County. And can anyone quickly answer what are the barriers to counties adopting the CPACE programs? the commercial property assessed clean energy? I think there's a short answer to that, to the barriers. It's, um, it's something Multnomah County has as well. And it's been of mixed success um, to get how, it's such a good idea. It's you pay back, you take, it's almost like taking a loan onto your energy bill and then you pay back over time with your energy bill just going up a little for the payment so that you take care of the upfront cost of an energy retrofit or solar panels or otherwise. But there's um, a, a lot of, uh, who likes to do that? Who wants to get into that kind of financing, um, take on those risks? There's, there's a lot under the hood there that has made local governments reticent. Um, but it's a, the financing element of all of this, as you could tell with all the talk of incentives and rebates and, all of this is, is a big piece of it um, that we have to keep figuring out. We don't have a green bank in Oregon or anything that helps make it a little less expensive to do these things up front. So that's something we have to keep solving for too. Okay. Thank you both Meredith and Jackie. You're so knowledgeable and you really know great strategies to really start making a bigger impact on both our personal and societal levels of carbon emissions and the impact we have on climate change. So I really thank both of you. I will save all of the chat and this will be available, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel so that people can view that in the future. And again, thank you. And next month, our speaker will be Shannon Lipscomb talking about childcare deserts in Central Oregon. So hope all of you will tune in for that. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you for inviting us. Jackie, we really so appreciate it.